Well, hello, um, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thanks to you all, uh, all of you who could join us in person this afternoon and uh, to many more who are participating online. I'm Fritz Mayer, the Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver. Um, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to conversation today with Ambassador Nina Hajikian. Um, uh, Ambassador Hajikian is the U.S. Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy at the Department of State. Uh, and the conversation will be about how the State Department is working to develop solutions and partnerships with cities and states to tackle global issues. Uh, as many of you know, you probably all know, um, this week in Denver, uh, we're, uh, the city is hosting the first City Summit of the Americas, where mayors and other officials from major cities uh, from North, South, and Central America and the Caribbean um, are gathering to promote the regional cooperation. Now, the Summit of the Americas uh, has occurred routinely since, I think, 1994, um, and it brings together federal leaders uh, um, to, from these countries. But this city summit is the first time a similar event has been conducted with local leadership. You know, as, as national and international politics uh, continue to be uh, divisive, um, particularly on key, key issues like climate change and migration and sustainable development, the city summit provides an opportunity to strengthen ties across national boundaries at the subnational level. So we're delighted to have Ambassador Hajikian here to discuss this initiative. Uh, a little more in our bio, she's the State Department's first U.S. Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy. Uh, prior to this post, she served as the first Deputy Mayor for International Affairs for the City of Los Angeles, where she uh, oversaw efforts that sent underserved community colleges on free educational international trips created a new public-private partnership to attract international business and nonprofits, prepared the city for the 2028 Olympic Games, and hosted, recently, the Summit of the Americas in 2022. As a former U.S. Ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, uh, Ambassador Hajikian has a wealth of knowledge on foreign affairs at both the local and federal uh, levels. And I recently had the pleasure to talk with her virtually um, uh, as part of our series of university office hours, which are leading up to the, to the city summit uh, here in Denver. So welcome, Ambassador Haji again. Um, our moderator today is Professor Nazneen Barma. Uh, Dr. Barma is professor here at the Corbeil School, as well as the founding director of the Scribner Institute of Public Policy. Uh, Dr. Barma teaches courses on public policy, international development policy, and political economy, and your research focuses particularly on economic development and institutional reform. Prior to joining the Corbell School faculty, Dr. Barmer was professor at the Naval Postgraduate School and a development practitioner at the World Bank. She's currently working on a collaborative project on transnational state building networks as a major form of contemporary multilateral engagement, so the perfect person to moderate today. So welcome to you both and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Dean Mayer, for that uh, wonderful warm introduction. Ambassador Hachigian, welcome to Denver. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us at the Corbell School uh, and to be kicking off, of course, uh, uh, the inaugural uh, City Summit of the uh, Americas. Um, you and your team at the State Department have been hard at work uh, uh, for, for many months, we know. Uh, planning the summit in partnership with the city of Denver. Uh, and, and the summit, as uh, Dean Mayer said, kicks off today. Let me begin by asking you, why do we need such an event as this at this time? And in particular, uh, focused on governments in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you for the question. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you to Dean Meyer and his team for uh, hosting us and setting us up. Um, talking with young people is one of my absolute favorite things to do. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so I'll give you a few reasons. Um, the Western Hemisphere is the most urbanized region in the world. Um, around 80% of folks live in cities, which means that what mayors do and how they do it affects a lot of people. Um, at the summit of the Americas last June, 
uh, national leaders made pledges to cooperate on all kinds of issues, health, climate change, um, clean energy, digital transformation, and democratic governance. <clears throat> and that's fantastic. Um, it's been very successful. But to implement any of that, you really need to engage local leaders because they are the ones who actually, you know, put the, <laughs> you know, put, put the cement in the ground and, and build things and see people and develop programs for people. Um, and this is especially true for climate change, which we can talk about. Uh, and then I'd say that finally, um, we've seen a, a trend of democratic backsliding around the world. So that's another region, another reason to engage mayors who are um, the ones who are in most in contact with people, like most people's experience of democracy is at that local level. So depend, So wh when they act and when they serve people in transparent, accountable and efficient ways, they are upholding the system of democracy. So those are a few of the reasons. Also mayors are just, great in general. Like they are so practical, so focused on problem solving. I was at a event this morning um, listening to a few mayors. One, one was uh, uh, from Ecuador and was an indigenous mayor who was wearing a beautifully embroidered, uh, I wasn't sure if I, she was sitting down, so I don't know if it was a shirt or a dress, but um, which had been made by a survivor of domestic violence because of their program. Um, and now she employs eight people making these beautiful things. So it's that kind of just these, you know, examples that just show you how important that, that very local level of governance is. Those of us who live in and around the city of Denver have been thinking about mayors a lot. Uh, Mayor Hancock is uh, coming to the end of his, uh, his uh, term limited. Uh, time at, at City Hall and we're just about to have a runoff, as you know, so it's, it's, it's great to kind of hear you talk about all of the different uh, incredibly important uh, policy and implementation all roles that, that mayors have. Um, as Dean Mayer said, you're the, currently the U.S. Uh, Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy, the first person to hold that role. You were also the first person to hold the role as uh, Deputy Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, uh, responsible for the international affairs portfolio. And I guess, you know, the, the, the point, question I want to ask is that we typically think of foreign policy as being conducted at the um, highest levels of government in terms of sort of, you know, national uh, and, and global, bilateral global uh, uh, connections. What impact can cities and local governments have? You mentioned implementation a, a few minutes ago, but in terms of the sort of foreign policy dimensions and on global affairs more broadly. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, well, mayors and and governors are the first responders to all these transnational threats that we've been experiencing lately. So that's a pandemic or an extreme weather event from climate change, cyber attacks. So I consider that to be a national security function in and of itself. Um, and they're also a critical part of the solution when it comes to some very high priority uh, foreign policy goals like tackling climate change. So the reason that, well, let me start this way. Our ability as a country to meet our targets of reducing carbon is implemented city by city, state by state, project by project. It's because this mayor decided that they were gonna now use renewable energy for their grid instead of coal and uh, uh, oil. And because this other mayor decided that they're gonna put an EV charging infrastructure, and this other mayor decided that the building codes would now uh, mean that every new building has to be energy efficient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that added up across the country, that's how we meet our climate change goals. And when we meet our climate change goals, we can then go to other countries and say, you know what, you need to do your fair share. We're doing our fair share. Um, and that then in turn means the, you know, when it all works well, everyone's meeting their climate change goals, which isn't quite working that well yet. But, um, but then that in turn helps those um, residents of the cities 
that are doing this work, right? They're, they're going to experience fewer extreme weather events, less heat, less fewer droughts, et cetera. Um, so it's this reinforcing kind of virtuous circle. Um, and there's a whole bunch of climate change mayor and uh, well mayor groups that are that are here for the city some of the americas there's at least three um and they take their delegations to cop pretty regularly so you have these like local leaders at the conference of parties which is the, the big un annual gathering where all the countries come and so they're there representing the united states um along with you know our our government but even more traditional foreign policy, um, like signing agreements, hosting heads of state, um, cities do that all the time. So after I left, I mean, we signed a whole bunch of agreements when I was in LA with countries, not and cities as well, but also countries. Um, and when and after I left, they signed another one with Singapore to um, to both together work toward a green shipping corridor between Singapore and Los Angeles, which has a big port. Um, and they, you know, we, we hosted many heads of state. Um, and now uh, there are, you have a lot of cities that are supporting um, the people of Ukraine, both, you know, with actual stuff that they're sending, but also importantly with, with solidarity. Um, and I think you'll be hearing from them later today, some Ukrainian mayors, but from what I've, when I've spoken, I only know one, so far, which is um, the mayor of Kiev, they're very grateful, both for the material, but also just for the fact that um, mayors in this country are um, not not forgetting and are you know still are flying the flags and lighting the you know monuments in the in, in blue and yellow. Um, I you know you mentioned uh, a few a few minutes ago how. Uh, uh, interesting and, and uh, thought provoking it is to, to have a chance to talk with young people. I had the chance to talk with a, a handful of eighth graders this morning uh, <laughs> who came to visit because uh, they were interested in questions of economic development and uh, state building and so on, which is what my work has been on. And so many of their questions focused on the kinds of things that you're talking about, these community level forms of sort of connectivity, resilience and hope and so on. Um, and I think, you know, what, what's so interesting in the context of the city summit, the first summit uh, being held uh, here, um, is the State Department's role in facilitating this work, right? So you're talking about this, you know, really important sort of bottom-up connectivity and how much implementation and policy is happening via that local level collaboration. Um, and I'm, I'm just really curious to hear kind of how the State Department has gotten involved in facilitating uh, that and, and partnering uh, with uh, local and, and uh, city and subnational government. Yeah. I actually think um, the State Department is a big place. I'm still getting to know it again. I've been I've worked for them before, but it's different being being here than being in it being at an embassy. Um, but I'm finding pockets of local stuff all over the place in the State Department. So, um, for example, the Strong City Network, which is a Net, an international network of cities focused on curbing racially or ethnically motivated violence. Um, so that has been supported by the State Department for years. Um, and anyway, all kinds of just uh, touch points here and there that I found. I think that our, um, our office, my new office, is really um, here now to kind of pull that all together and take it further. Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 motivation for me in a lot of this is, you know, we've talked about all these things that mayors do, but when mayors get together and they share examples of what they're doing, they can create really powerful change. So I know that from being in LA, we, we were borrowing stuff from other cities all the time. Um, we were inspired to by Mexico City's earthquake early warning system. That caused us to create our own earthquake early warning system that then the, the state of California adopted. So now because of that interaction with, the, with Mexico City, you know, every Californian is slightly a few seconds safer than they would have been, you know, before. And there are just many, many examples of this. So this bringing them all together to chit chat and to, you know, present to each other and all that, I think a lot of the, the power of the summit, we won't actually 
necessarily ever really know in its full scope because a lot of this happens informally. Um, but uh, but I for sure know that we are you know creating change. Wonderful. Um, you know, Dean Mayer mentioned that I'm the founding director of the Scrivener Institute of Public Policy. Just moved here to, to Denver and Colorado uh, just two and a half years ago. And so I'm kind of learning about how the city works and, and, and how policy works. And so much of, of what I've seen in terms of public policy here is those connections between uh, the city government, but not just the government with the private sector and civil society and so on. And you mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, the importance of collaboration uh, uh, on climate change. Um, I wonder if you uh, if you have any uh, uh, more to say about sort of how governments in the Western Hemisphere, local governments, have been collaborating on climate change specifically, or if there are other areas of sort of policy collaboration uh, that, that that you would point to as sort of things to really kind of take take note of. Yeah, um, a lot of the way cities collaborate there. So there there are various programs, and the State Department has some of them as well that are connecting. Uh, cities. In fact, we're going to be announcing one at this summit called Cities Forward, which mm. will be connecting um, cities in the United States with, with uh, Latin American cities that they will together sort of apply to do a project together on sustainability. Um, so there are, there are a variety of those kinds of things, but much of the way mayors collaborate is through networks that are set up, they're nonprofit you know, institutions that are set up to exactly uh, you know, um, encourage that, this kind of collaboration. And I mentioned a few of them, or maybe I didn't mention them, but like C40 is one, um, ICLE uh, and Climate Cities, those, all three of those are, are these kinds of networks on climate in particular, but there are many, many more. And it's, it's fascinating to me that there's this whole global conversation that happens among cities and very few people know about it. Um, and it happens at the mayoral level, and then it happens at the level of like specific experts on whatever transportation or transportation, et cetera. Um, it, it happens with cities and regions also. The under two coalition is a climate organization at that level. Um, so we are actually bringing all these networks together. I think this will be the biggest meeting of city networks ever. Um, I don't think there's ever been one where you know, the, the people who do climate are also connected to the people who do migration and are also connected to the, you know, there, there are some U.S. mayoral networks that are just about being a U.S. mayor, like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, for example. Wow. So, yeah. What also seems extraordinary about the program uh, that, um, you know, that you all have uh, succeeded in putting together here in Denver is, is the inclusion also of the, the arts and, uh, you know, all the different uh, <laughs> things that are happening uh, downtown just Highly encourage everybody to, to, to head down there if you can, just to see all the extraordinary uh, uh, collaboration that's happening. I want to just mention too, I have the privilege of, of asking uh, Ambassador Hajigian a few questions here, but also want to remind folks that we have note cards uh, on the tables uh, for you. So please do uh, write down uh, a question uh, that, that you might like the ambassador to answer and our wonderful uh, Corbell team is going to circulate um, and, and collect those questions and, and pass them up to me in, in just a few minutes. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, Ambassador, that the, the Western Hemisphere is the most urbanized uh, region in the world. I didn't know that. I grew up in East Asia. I grew up in Hong Kong, actually, one of the biggest cities in the, in the world. Uh, and I kind of had a parochial sense that East Asia was the most urbanized uh, part of the world. You served as the ambassador to the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, too, um, where so much rapid urban growth has, has really driven public policy and, uh, and, and, and foreign policy. Um, you know, according to the World Bank, about over half of the global population lives in cities today, and by 2045, the world's urban uh, population will increase to 6 billion. Um, how does this rapid urbanization um, change the role of the city in, in global politics? I think it, you know, just basically means that more and more people um, will have to have their needs served by mayors, whether that's for you know, clean water or safety or opportunity or equity, that these um, values are now in the hands of, of local government more and more. Um, and that's, to me, exactly why it's important to work with city leaders. You know, they're the ones on the front lines 
they're the ones governing these you know massive numbers of people um they're the ones who have to respond who have to create who have to innovate uh every day because that they have no choice that's that's what their role is um and it means that they need the resources to do that well um and that will probably eventually require some slight uh modifications to the way you know our our global institutions work now because they all work through countries right um it also means that the challenges will continue to emerge there um from pandemics to water scarcity uh, migration uh, they will all emerge in cities first I mean, when you talk about the pandemic response in particular, I mean, you know, so so much of the sort of th the things that require kind of rapid policy responses happen in cities, as you just said, right? The, the pandemic emerging in, in Wuhan, China. When we think about, you know, here in the United States, the urban wildlife interface and how, you know, climate hazards kind of occur in those areas where dense populations are kind of pushing out uh, in a geographical sense and, and so on, is there, you mentioned earlier the earthquake uh, crisis sort of response uh, collaboration between uh, the state of California and the Mexican government. Are there other things happening in, in terms of um, these sort of crisis response uh, that the Western hemisphere, local and subnational government governments are cooperating on that you might tell us about? Um, I am sure there are. And uh, the one that's coming to mind for me is um, that, during the well yes is the answer and then that crisis you know could be um of climate change it could be of pandemics and they are those are all being cooperated on i remember that during the during um i was i was in government during the COVID 19 mm. pandemic and we my uh, mayor was chair of this global um alliance of mega cities that are all focused on reducing their emissions called c40 and that became a, uh, a, a COVID-19 response uh, group. And so the, mm. the mayors had conversations, sometimes 55 at a time, and you'd hear from the mayor of Milan where the epicenter was at that moment. Um, and he would be able to say, this is what's coming. And you, we heard from the mayor of Seoul who would say, we're trying mm. this drive-through testing mm. you know, mechanism, which then we also, we also adopted in uh, Los Angeles um, and the staff. Uh, there was another another network. I started a gender equity uh, network for cities, and it was supposed to launch in March of 2020. Uh, and that became a a WhatsApp group of city staff with the same kinds of questions of like, how are you feeding your elderly people? Like, are you shutting down your kindergartens? Um, and we've heard anecdotally that some of that innovation that city leaders were hearing about made its way to national government policy. Um, so the answer is like cities are collaborating on just about all the all the emergencies. And sometimes it's formally through networks, sometimes it's informally. Um, sometimes, you know, it's the State Department that it's putting folks together to to do that collaboration. And we of course have, you know, I don't even know like how to quantify it, but many, many programs that are directly helping people as well in the hemisphere. Um, you know, one thing that seems especially striking about that is the question of scale, right? That there are things that you can do, policies that you can innovate at the scale of the city and adapt and then scale up um, that can't be done at a, at a kind of a higher level of government and, and certainly in the context of a more gridlocked kind of national uh, uh, system. So again, just a reminder to folks to, 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 to give us questions if, if you'd like to. I have one question that came in earlier uh, from a, um, a, a virtual audience member. And this sort of relates to you know, the role of the State Department in this work. And the question is, what is the State Department doing to help young people, especially those interested in city and state diplomacy, um, overcome um, you know, the barriers that may exist to, uh, to being able to do public service in this space in terms of you know, being able to, to join federal government service uh, or to find other pathways into this kind of work? Great question. Um, and I do want your students' questions. So there's no dumb questions. Plus, <laughs> this will probably be anonymous anyway. So 
I promise they will be. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a wealth of opportunities that the State Department has, um, some especially geared to low-income students. Um, we now have paid internships uh, and paid study abroad, paid language uh, immersion programs, and other cultural and exchange programs. You can find these all at exchanges.state.gov and also careers.state.gov. Um, we absolutely need your uh, bright and motivated minds um, and all kinds of people to take on the mantle of diplomacy with us. We want the State Department to look like the United States and represent the diversity that's in the United States. Um, we want folks of all backgrounds and experiences. Um, we have, you know, medical officers and tech, many tech uh, folks, uh, as well as diplomats. We have diplomats, we have, you know, economists and, um, you know, basically any kind of study that you've had would be relevant to a career in the State Department. And, um, and another route would be to work either before or after for a city or state government. We don't have a specific program set up yet to, uh, to facilitate that, but um, anyone who's interested should just contact us directly and we can try to figure it out. So it's subnational at state.gov. Um, and uh, we hope over time to have a way to um, make it easy for students to get that kind of experience in a mayor's or governor's office. Subnational at state.gov. Got that, everyone? I think that's one of the most important things that we should uh, we should blast out from from this from this event. Thank you for that. And and actually, the first question that, that that's coming to us from from the from the group here um, is a sort of parallel question to that. I mean, I asked a question about how can young people get involved in in city and uh, state government. This question is about how does the State Department work with local youth networks. So perhaps the non, uh, the, the civil, uh, uh, civic society and so on. And how can those youth networks uh, perhaps effectively work with local, state, and uh, federal governments uh, globally? Yeah, good question. Um, there's a part of the State Department that does um, a lot of cultural exchange and um, education, and they work with uh, they work with um, local youth um, uh, organizations, and and I. I mean, I've seen them be extremely powerful. Um, and I think we're probably all aware of the, the different, uh, the different um, causes that youth networks have, have taken on and how much they've been able to move the needle. Um, and so what I don't know is to what degree there are like international youth networks. I think actually I do know there's a couple of them, um, but that's an area that might be you know, interesting to explore. Um, further. And we do when we are talking with um, mayors or governors, they're um, often kind of bringing in different parts of their community to, uh, you know, to, to work on whatever it might be hosting something or, um, you know, a big cultural event. Um, you mentioned the art and the culture that's happening uh, downtown. And that's all, you know, that's all Denver's doing. And it's fantastic. Um, there's an organization called the Biennial of the Americas that's here in Denver. I assume you all know about it. Um, I didn't know about it until I uh, until we started doing this, but they're pretty fantastic. And um, they also are um, doing a lot of youth engagement. Uh, so. uh, fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, sort of questions here from, from our students about the, these kinds of kind of connections. Um, and, and one question actually that, that, that just came up here is, um, I think in response to kind of what you were just saying, is whether there are opportunities for international students, non-American citizens to, uh, to participate, you know, perhaps in the State Department, I don't know what the rules are on that anymore, but how might international students, you know, we have many international students here at the Corbell School, um, how might international students get involved in the kinds of things that you're talking about? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, we should absolutely be taking advantage of, of that, that kind of connectivity. Um, there's you know, roles that can happen um, with the State Department, but there's also just everything that you can do uh, as an international student uh, to create that, those connections yourself, um, mm. because that's incredibly important. 
I mean, we, um, we can, you know, handle the nation to nation stuff and then some, you know, the city to city and state to state stuff, but that people to people connection, that is really a huge part of foreign policy. Um, it's, um, that connectivity makes a big difference to the character of a relationship. Um, so I encourage you all to just to, you know, to build pathways uh, yourselves as well as with us. Let me just mention kind of in, in, in this context that the, the Corbell School was honored to partner with the State Department on uh, what we call the University Office Hours uh, series. Um, where we had a, you know, a number of students moderating, Ambassador Hachigian, you and Dean Mayer uh, uh, you know, kicked off the, the first one. Uh, the last one, actually, Mayor Hancock uh, participated uh, uh, in as well. Uh, we have all of them, I think, available uh, you know, on the Corbell website. So I would highly recommend if anybody's more interested in, in, in this question, each of these sessions was moderated by a student, which was really wonderful to kind of get that, that perspective in there. Uh, and it was great. I participated in one on uh, misinformation and, and democracy. Um, and what was really terrific is that it was, you know, basically all kind of questions from the audience, questions that were coming in from students. And I think, uh, you know, the great thing is, as you said at the beginning about being able to participate with young people on these issues is that they ask questions that you, you haven't thought about, right? So um, I'm making, a, making us think. I'm going to read the next question uh, verbatim because I think it's, it's a really important one. Um, how, how could we address the criticism that subnational diplomacy can be perceived as, in quotes, where's wasting, wasting money on fancy international trips uh, instead of uh, focusing their resources on their cities and on their domestic. Excellent question. Um, and it is true that mayors are criticized uh, when they do really anything international. Um, so a few answers to that. One is that their international engagement can be a source of jobs. So a trade delegation or attracting um, foreign investment into their city, that is a job creating uh, mechanism. Uh, the second is they can be finding solutions to some of the problems that you know, a given city faces as they are meeting with other um, city leaders internationally. Um, Third is that I think any um, you know, good mayor nowadays has to keep some kind of global perspective like back to these, you know, the threats that really harm residents, right? For many of them are global in nature. And so having a sense of you know, what, what those are, how you fight them, where they're coming from, et cetera, I think is a really valuable, um, valuable information for mayors. Um, and then I'd say, lastly, you know, the, the life of a city is, it is potholes, it is clean water, it is um, public safety, but it's also culturally rich. And that's another reason that, um, or it's another kind of um, benefit that mayors can bring from doing international work. I mean, just also foreshadow that, um, you know, in, in, you mentioned the, the biennial of, of the Americas that has been very involved uh, with uh, in partnering with, with State Department and the city. On the city summit, uh, we are co-hosting with them a, a, a mayoral debate between our two runoff candidates, Mike Johnson and Kelly Bruff, uh, in a few weeks on, on May 18th. And in fact, what we're going to focus that event on is exactly the kinds of issues that you were just discussing, right? Sort of what role do, do mayors have in these sort of international issues and how can they tie uh, those interactions back to the potholes and the, and the you know, pub, public safety and security and, and so on and so forth. And of course, one of the issues that is sort of inherently global and local at the same time is the issue of migration. Um, and we have a, a great question here about just the just an enormous amounts of migration from Central and, uh, America uh, to the United States and to our cities in particular. Uh, Denver had um, earlier in, in the winter, uh, earlier this year, uh, you know, a huge influx of, of migrants uh, being bussed in. Uh, and there was a major response mounted in, in relation to that that is now winding down. Um, and so I'm, I'm you know, curious to hear any thoughts, uh, your thoughts on sort of the role of cities and the kind of connectivity and collaboration that's happening at the city summit in addressing an issue like migration. Yeah, absolutely. 
This is an issue that is shared throughout the hemisphere. All cities across the hemisphere are, are dealing with these, you know, these large numbers of people, particularly from Venezuela. Um, I was earlier, as I said, in the, this event with the mayor of Bogota, they've resettled like half a million uh, Venezuelans and have set up migrant centers where they can get uh, everything they need and be connected to jobs and education, et cetera. Um, so this is absolutely gonna be a topic of conversation. Um, I mean, cities have the work of settling and integrating migrants. And there's, um, there's an organization called the Mayor's Migration Council, uh, and there's others, but the Mayor's Migration Council uh, advocates um, for the voice of cities in these international um, uh, conversations about um, the, like the UN uh, Pact on Refugees and the UN Pact on Migration. Um, so that's, anyway, but we, were going, we were going to be talking about it the idea is for cities to learn from each other on how to do it well. Um, and it's a, it's a common challenge in the, in the hemisphere. Thank you. I just wanna remind people, we've, we've got a little bit more time here. Would love to get more, I have plenty of questions, but I would love to get more questions from all of you if you're, uh, if you're interested in, in chiming in and our team is collecting them uh, um, from around here. So shifting gears a little bit, you know, Dean Mayer mentioned at the beginning, the importance of, you know, in a context of, national gridlock and, and national polarization, political polarization, the importance of uh, public policy and conversation and discourse happening at the city and subnational level. And the question uh, that, that came up is, um, can better city integration in the Americas help with the democratic backsliding uh, issues in the Americas uh, and, and perhaps globally as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, first of all, you know, mayors are, are Pretty nonpartisan. Some of their role, many of the of them are actually elected as a nonpartisan. Um, uh, that their their actual positions are nonpartisan in many cities. Um, but I often remember my, the mayor I worked for saying, like, he'd go to these conferences and be, you know, chatting with with mayors about different kinds of things and have no idea what their party affiliation was because mayors are just intensely practical. Um, and I do think. Um, that that mayors absolutely have a role in um, in maintaining and defending democracy um, because they are the ones that are closest to the people. So I really think democracy begins in cities and begins with mayors as they are serving their residents in a transparent and accountable way, and they're doing it efficiently, and they're doing it well, and they're innovating. That's the experience that people have of government, and if that's going well, they, they are um, more likely to be um, supportive of democracy and less tolerant of uh, leaders who want to uh, erode it or take it away. Um, a, lot, a lot of the work that I did at the World Bank um, uh, in, in East Asia and the Pacific and post-conflict countries was about exactly this kind of concept of sort of getting as close government as close as possible to the people right getting that sort of state society interface kind of as 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 close to the community level as you can in order to build that sort of public trust mm -hmm. um, and government legitimacy that sort of emerges from that and i mean do you see that as sort of something that's that's sort of really necessary in the context of democratic backsliding today that uh, this is the level at which that legitimacy and trust is sort of being forged or couldn't be reforged in cases where um, there has been a sort of dissipation of it. I mean, I think we have to work at all levels, but it's absolutely true when you look at studies that that um, local leaders are the most trusted, um, the most trusted level of government by by hmm. by ordinary folk. Um, so, I guess you know, I, I you have to do that work, whether or not you're, you're also doing work, and you should be at the provincial and national level for sure. But uh, it is the it is the it is the place that touches most people, and how most people experience government in their lives is at that level. Um, I'm a comparativist by training, a comparativist political scientist, and so given that you've worked in East Asia uh, so extensively in Southeast Asia, and now the focus of the city summit, of course, um, uh, on the Western Hemisphere, I'm curious if if you have noticed 
differences in the ways that city and subnational collaboration and interaction happens across regions? Is it different in Asia in some ways than it is in the Western hemisphere? I mean, we've talked a lot about similarities so far in our mm -hmm. conversation. I'm mm -hmm. just curious if there are different. Yeah, I mean, I think what the similarities is, is that mayors everywhere are sort of fighting the same challenges. Um, I, there was, I was talking to the mayor of Chattanooga, who um, was in a program with um, a Latin American mayor who said that they had a conversation, you know, uh, and they're, they're, they have the same exact kinds of challenges that they're both trying to uh, face. But, so that, I think, is the similarities. Um, I don't... I think there are different parts of the world that are more and less connected at that level. Mm. Um, and what I'm thinking about is Europe, which is really connected at the city level. Mm. Like those mayors and globally, but those mayors are seeing each other regularly. Um, mm -hmm. They have, they tend to have, um, you know, a good amount of capacity, which is actually not something we've discussed yet. And this is not exactly your question, but it's an important point to raise, which is that um, it, it's a paradox about the United States that on the one level, there's a whole lot of international activity. So there's mayors and governors all over the world all the time from the United States doing all, you know, doing trade missions or trying to, um, you know, speaking on a uh, panel on climate or what have you. Uh, so there's a lot of activity. Um, on the other hand, they are much less resourced uh, to do international work than their counterparts are in other places. So um, the governor of uh, Tokyo, the mayor of Tokyo, Governor uh, Kawike, who's fantastic, but she has 50-ish people doing international work. Uh, and I've been told that the um, Shanghai government has like 100 and Warsaw has 25. Just to give you a few examples, our mayors, you know, the biggest office in the United States is New York's. They have 10 people doing this work. And most mayors have nobody at all doing, you know, thinking about the international engagement aspect. So um, that's another reason, that's, an, that's another uh, challenge that we have that I, that, that in my office I want to try to help solve is to give uh, mayors and governors a little bit more capacity than they currently have to to do this international outreach. That that's really fascinating, and I actually it did occur to me as I was kind of you know um, thinking about your your experiences or what has brought you here, uh, the fact that you were the first deputy mayor of Los Angeles uh, for you know, responsible for the international affairs portfolio is kind of extraordinary, actually, right? Uh, the, you know, Los Angeles is an enormous city, right, within, you know, certainly the Pacific Rim ties and the, the port, as you mentioned earlier. What, what is it that has held up the United States in this kind of city uh, uh, diplomacy? That's a really good question, and I, I don't have a great answer for it yet. Um, so a couple of theories, like we're a big country, so if you want to learn about, you know, something like a better way to do a sewer system, you, you know, you call the mayor in the next state, not across the world. So that could be part of it. In general, we are not a country that invests heavily in our government <laughs> at any level. So there's that. I think that might be, might be part of it as well. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know why it is that we've not done more. But like I said, what I have found is there is actually a lot of activity. It's just not um, known to most people. Right. So there's a one of the one one of the initiatives that I've learned about in the job, which is fascinating to me, is the mayors along the Mississippi. So there are about a hundred mayors, um, and it covers a whole bunch of states. Um, have have experienced flooding and they've gotten together to implement a nature-based solution to their flooding challenges. So restoring wetlands, et cetera. They were a cop at the conference of parties, uh, this last one, uh, and lobbying for, you know, different kinds of climate legislation. And they're very sophisticated and very internationally connected. And I had no idea. And I'm, you know, and I was deputy mayor for international affairs. So it's like the kind of thing that I, I should have known about. 
So I think there's actually a lot that goes on and we just, you know, don't hear about it that much. And I don't think, I'm hoping that over time, this international role for local leaders is more accepted and more, under, and more understood to be the beneficial, uh, you know, the, the, the beneficial task that it is. There's a lot of learning to be done sort of even here in, in the United States and you know, your, your new office at the, at the State Department, that's one sort of an enormously important uh, function. Um, question here about, you know, we've been talking about big cities for the most part because that's where this policy innovation is happening um, uh, and the, the sort of big, you know, uh, innovations are, are coming out of. Um, question is, what is um, your office's or kind of engagement and collaboration more generally with small and medium-sized towns? You mentioned just now the rural kind of Mississippi, uh, you know, aspect. How much do we know about what's going on at that level? And, you know, to what extent is there a sense that collaboration and learning is also happening um, in rural America? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to mayors from smaller, mid-sized and smaller cities. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was talking to this one mayor in Florida who he introduced me for an event and it's a pretty small city, but very international because of a major horse competition that happens there. So he is a very internationally engaged mayor, but it's all about horses. Um, and then I've talked to other smaller town mayors who, um, who've resettled many, um, uh, um, tranches, or that's not the right word, but the, but the many different kinds of refugees over the years, different waves of refugees that have come in. And so they're now like dozens of languages spoken in this place. And, um, and others who have like a particular cultural festival that they do um, mm -hmm. every year that brings people from all over the world. So there's quite a bit of activity um, in, in smaller, smaller cities and, and uh, you know, cities that are more in rural areas also. Obviously, agriculture is a big, um, you know, part of the conversation when you're talking about um, rural areas, yeah. Um, we, we had a conversation um, here, um, the Corbell School hosts uh, a series called the Denver Dialogues in partnership with four national uh, think tanks, the Aspen Institute, Hoover Institution, uh, New America, and um, um, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, we had a conversation about migration, migration policy, and we had a small roundtable lunch uh, with folks in the community who work on these issues. And we had a, um, a colleague from the Aurora Chamber, the head of the chamber, and he said at this lunch that uh, Aurora, which is Denver's neighboring city, um, and I think competes with Colorado Springs, kind of goes back and forth on being Colorado's second largest city, is by uh, sort of uh, you know one particular measure of, of, of fragmentation, the most diverse city in America, right? <laughs> And he even said it's more diverse than Brooklyn, if you can kind of imagine that. And it's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. It's like these different ways in which cities attract mm -hmm. uh, people from, from all different walks of life and for different reasons. I love the horse reason, uh, <laughs> but you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of different things going on. I have one very specific question here. I wanna make sure to, to ask it and we can think about um, uh, different ways of answering it. The UN Convention on Biological Diversity is launching cities and regions with nature programs. So it's a question about sustainability and climate change. Um, will cities forward be supporting cities with nature as a common platform between partner cities? Or are you aware of kind of other kind of collaborations around biodiversity and, um, and, and that sort of thing at the city level? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I am sure um, like the, the nature-based solution um, is, is a, you know, is very much in the conversation among mayors about, um, and, the, and the circular economy and all that. So it's very much on um, a topic of conversation in cities nowadays. Um, so my guess is for sure that, that the Cities Forward program would be happy to, I mean, the way it works is cities apply. So they, if they're bringing, you know, their, um, uh, you know, their program that to create or to preserve um, uh, biodiversity, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that would be considered to be a perfectly, you know, wonderful and qualifying uh, program. Fantastic. I'm going to take the prerogative of the last couple of questions here, if I may, for the last few minutes we have. Um, and I, I guess I just want to ask you to give us a sense of your, you know, your preview of what should we should be expecting over the next uh, 
few days at the, at the city summit. Um, one question that kind of occurred to the team is to ask who you're most excited to meet in attendance <laughs> at the city summit. Well, mayors, <laughs> of course, as many as I can, um, next to students, they're like, you know, some of my absolutely favorite people. Um, so I will be doing a lot of, you know, meetings with mayors. Um, and I'm really excited about that. There is just all kinds of stuff happening. And I can't even like, I would just go to the website and look because I cannot get my mind around the hundred or more uh, kinds of interactions. So we'll have these big plenary, um, you know, presentations uh, and, um, uh, you know, remarks by various, um, you know, fancy people, including my boss, the Secretary of State. Um, and then there will be, um, these smaller sessions that are focused on, you know, more specific like challenges that, you know, that can get pretty technical. We did that smart cities thing earlier today. Um, then there are, you know, other kinds of roundtables. Um, there are side events. Um, there's a lot of bilateral conversations that are happening among mayors that they're setting up, you know, um, for themselves as well. Um, so just an incredible, like, plethora of, of uh, different kinds of events that are coming up and hope to see you all at, at some of them. Given your knowledge of sort of who's coming, who the, who the delegates are, who the participants are, and, and so on, what sets of issues do you and your team anticipate are most at the forefront of people's minds? If people are coming here to solve problems, what are those problems that they're facing and hoping to address here? Yeah, I think that's really just going to vary by city mm -hmm. and by, you know, whatever is um, a pri priority issues for, for those mayors. And it can really vary, you know, some um, could be, you know, public safety or it could be migration or it could be climate change or it could be, you know, transition to a lower, um, lower carbon economy. Um, I mean, could be smart city, could be um, using data for better governance could be um, trying to bridge the digital divide. Uh, I mean, could be all, all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, bringing in women into the workforce. I mean, there's, uh, I think it's gonna really depend on, on the mayors. Um, Fantastic, well, I'm looking forward to kind of engaging with those wonderful themes that the, uh, the team has established and, and all those side events. Um, Ambassador Hachigian, thank you so much for, for being here. You have an incredibly busy <laughs> schedule, as we're very well aware of, given all the events that are, that are going on. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us at the, at the Corbell School. I'm going to wrap up just a couple of minutes early here. Perhaps you won't mind saying hello to a few of our students of uh, um, uh, to, uh, to, to begin with, but we know you have a tight schedule. So uh, we're very grateful uh, for this fantastic conversation uh, for you joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much.